Uh, welcome to everybody to this um, session on multiple conversions. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my sincere appreciation and my gratitude to the colleagues who organized uh, this very rich conference, as well as to the team who is in charge of the practical uh, uh, aspects. Uh, I have uh, learned a lot from the various presentations and uh, uh, the, the topic of this conference is uh, related to one of my of the main centers of interest that I am pursuing, uh, namely the interface of people of different religions at the same shrines, uh, at the shared sacred places, uh, mainly in the Mediterranean region. And many years ago, the British uh, scholar Frederick Hasluck in his uh, pioneering work on the interactions between Christians and Muslims in the Ottoman Empire has already showed the complex relations between the transfer of centuries and the mixing of faithful. Uh, I just would like to add, uh, before uh, introducing the, the speakers, to add a short uh, announcement. In the last years, I have curated with other colleagues an exhibition on shared sacred sites. This exhibit started in Marseille and then, and then traveled to several places, uh, Tunis, Thessaloniki, Paris, Marrakesh, New York. Two years ago, it has been presented in Istanbul at Depot and in some weeks, a new venue will be displayed in Ankara at CERN Modern Museum. Uh, from the beginning of May to late June. This exhibit documents the practice, uh, practices of people who share the sacred sites, and it is, in the, is also concerned with the issue of the conversions of uh, sacred places. So it may perhaps interest someone in the audience. Uh, let me now briefly introduce the first speaker of this panel, uh, as you know, there has been a last minute, minute shift in the program, so I have the chance to, um, to introduce uh, Vanessa de Obadia and to thank her for uh, the, the uh, huge work he has done to organize uh, this uh, uh, wonderful conference. Uh, Vanessa um, has an international uh, formation uh, she has a BA from the University of Cambridge, an MA uh, from Marmar University, and a graduate di diploma in law from uh, BPP University in London. She was awarded a PhD in history by my university in Aix Marseille uh, three years ago, and uh, uh, she's now um, holding a postdoctoral position uh, at the University of Mainz in the framework of, framework of an ERC uh, starting grant project. Uh, she has published a num uh, number of articles in peer review journals and is currently co-editing a um, collective volume on Latin Catholicism in Ottoman Istanbul which will be published by the Isis Press in late uh, to, um, in this year, to, before the, uh, the, the end of, the, of this, this year. I'm waiting for his, uh, pu this publication. And uh, her research interests include uh, um, doctrine and practice in Islamic law, uh, non-Muslim and their communal and religious inst institutions in the Ottoman Empire and the study of historical and contemporary uh, charitable endowments. So um, the floor uh, uh, is uh, yours. Uh, so I'm happy to hear you now. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Professor Alvera. Um, it's my pleasure to um, be able to present my research on this panel and to be um, part of the session uh, with such uh, distinguished academics. If you'll just bear with me, I will share my screen. Okay. 
since the dissolution of the Latin Empire in 1261, Latin Catholic churches in Constantinople experienced the occasional conversion and transformation into Orthodox sanctuaries. With the Ottoman conquest two centuries later, they were subjected to gradual but systematic expropriation and conversion for either religious or secular purposes. For example, a couple of decades after the Ottoman conquest of Istanbul in 1453, the 14th century Dominican Church of St. Paul was converted into a mosque in 1478, later known as Arab Jami. Its conversion was Islamically justified by the practice of converting the most prominent church in the area into a Muslim place of worship. This justification was complemented by the Ottoman era refuted tradition that it was formerly the site of a mosque built during the Arab siege. A couple of centuries later, emerges another very well documentary, uh, documented case of the conversion of what was left of the conventual Franciscan complex of St. Francis following the Galata conflagration in May 1696. The construction of Galata New Mosque in 1698 was commissioned by the chief consort of Sultan Mehmed IV, Ametullah Rabia Gulnur Sultan. Similar to the Dominican case, the expropriation and conversion of St. Francis was justified Islamically and influenced by local and international factors, including an increase in Orthodox Sunni sentiment and diplomatic tensions between the Ottoman state and Catholic powers. By the end of the Ottoman era, the transformation of Latin Catholic places of worship took a variety of secular forms, in addition to the traditional mosques and quarter mosques. These included depots, a cultural center, and even a Turkish bath, thereby satisfying religious, demographic, political, and economic needs. During the era of the Turkish Republic, conversion was often facilitated by the abandonment of such spaces of worship due to the reduction and disappearance of congregations of worshippers and or the withdrawal of missionaries back to their countries of origin. As an example, in 1895, the church uh, founded in 1895 of the Oblates of the Assumption Missionary Sisters located in Haida Pasha was transformed into a concert hall and exhibition venue in 2012 while preserving the building's history. The latter situation is also reflected in the following case study of the conversion of a late Ottoman era Latin Catholic church in Girasun into a secular space during the Republican era. After this very brief overview, I shall focus on my case study of Girasun Children's Library. The city of Girasun is located on the slopes of a volcanic promontory on a peninsula in the Eastern Black Sea region. While the exact date of the construction of the fortress and settlement is unknown, Girison had a rich history boasting Hittite, Roman, Greek, Byzantine and Genoese traces and remained an important commercial and military center. The Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II captured Girison without force of arms on his return from his conquest of Trabzon in 1461. Subsequently, it developed into a port city and began to adapt an Islamic character. Gideson also housed a flourishing, flourishing communities of Greek, Armenians and Jews, both in its main town and outlying villages, working in trade, commerce and skilled labor. However, the wars and population displacements and exchange of the early 20th century caused their decimation, resulting in a detrimental impact on the economy of the province. By the late 19th century, it is recorded that there were nine churches functioning as Christian places of worship. Today, there are none. 
It is in this coastal town with its abundance of wild cherry and hazelnut orchards that the third branch of the Franciscans decided to found their new mission. The Order of Friars Minor Capuchin had first entered the Ottoman capital in 1587 as chaplains to the French ambassador. Their mission soon flourished in Istanbul and expanded to other parts of Ottoman Anatolia, Smyrna, Mardin, and the Black Sea region. The Capuchins who had settled in the city of Trabzon in 1845 decided to expand their mission to the west along the coast of Giresun. Through the mediation of the French embassy, the Capuchin peti uh, Capuchins petitioned the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1910 with a request for the permission to construct a church and bell tower in addition to a friary on three pieces of land located in the district of Chinarlar, which literally mean, li means sycamore, in Girasun, for which the friars had in their possession three title deeds. The response to the petition was not immediate and its obtainment was not simple. This is attested in a letter dated the 3rd of August 1911 from the French consul, in which he expresses the satisfaction of the French embassy as well as the joy of the French consulate at the successful obtainment of an imperial decree after a lengthy process. This delay can be attributed to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs concern about the, pro uh, the proximity of the new Latin Catholic Church to the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox Gogora Church, cemetery and houses, as well as the absence of uh, Latin Catholic Ottoman subjects in the city. Regardless, on the 14th of June 1911, an imperial decree was issued in the name of the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed V Rashad, and in it the Sultan confirms his assent to the granting of a permit for the construction of the church, bell tower and friary. The measurements of the building were specified as follows. A church with a length of 23, a width of 10 and a height of 13 metres, with a bell tower at a height of 18 metres. A friary with a length of 22 metres, a width of 9 metres and a height of 14 metres. The construction of the church was overseen by the French architect Pierre Collaro. The church was constructed with a rectangular plan and a single nave. The main facade had a triangular frontal with grooved stone columns on the, on the corners. On all four facades, there were Gothic windows with a pointed arch. The, uh, the square bell tower was adjacent to the east facade of the church. The church's entrance was through a monumental porch, which was separated from the main part of the building by a, a two uh, winged wooden door. The stained glass windows and the tile mosaics of floral and geometrical designs covering the floor were unique elements which created a striking visual impact upon the entering, uh, upon entering the main hall. So the proliferation of church construction in Anatolia during the Tansimat period and late 19th century was succeeded in sharp contrast by the population exchange forced migration and decimation of the first quarter of the 20th century, leaving such, such structures empty of life. The impact continued to be noted even in 1952, uh, as described in, a, in the reports of the last British consul in Trabzon, Vorley Harris. Churches located in rural Anatolia were primarily transformed into mosques, some of them into museums and a minority into libraries, exhibition halls, arts and cultural centers. In the Black Sea region, the more notable transformations include the conversion of the Byzantine Church of the Hagia Sophia located in Trabzon into a mosque in 1584, then into a museum in 1964.
before its reconversion into a mosque in 2013. In addition to uh, the Giris, uh, in Girison itself, um, you have the example of the 16th century Basilica of Gorgora, which was transformed into a prison in between 1948 and seven, uh, 67, and was redesigned as a museum um, of the same name in 1988. So uh, the Ministry of, uh, when it comes to the conversion of the church, uh, this was decided uh, by the Ministry of National Education uh, when it chose to move the children's library from its original place in a section of the Jumhuriyad Secondary School, where it had uh, originally opened in 1952. The Gurusan Public Library Directorate then undertook repairs on the church and the library was inaugurated in 1967. With the exception of the shortening of the bell tower to the same height as the building, Restoration was undertaken without altering the edifice's facade and interior. The question that arises, why its conversion into a children's library? In 2018, Osgur Demirkan published an interesting study on the refunctioning of the church in the context of urban identity. He attributes its conversion to a library to two main reasons to the city's urban and population growth and to a deficit in libraries in an area with numerous schools. This point is supported by a piece in Ishik newspaper in, uh, published in 1925, which highlighted how the shortage of educational buildings was addressed by the transformation of those previously used by non-Muslims. How did the political events on a local and national level impact such conversions? The Republican era initiated a process of radical urban transformation within the framework of modernization and secularization, which initiated in the central cities and expanded into the rural cities and towns in subsequent decades. In Girasun, the 15th century Sultan Salim Jami and its surrounding buildings were demolished in 1933. In the 1960s, important secular symbols were added to Gerasen city center in the form of a bust of Ataturk in 1963 and his statue in 1966, in front of the most symbolic building in the city, the new city hall. In 1967, the Capuchin Church was transformed into a children's library. Shortly after, in 1971, Turkey enacted a law banning private higher education institutions, resulting in the closure of the Greek Orthodox Theological School of Halki. Could such actions be said to represent a systematic, albeit unenacted, national policy for erasing for the erasal of religious, especially non-Muslim traces? The transformation of the church into a children's library certainly contributed to the secular identity of Girison's modernization project. Yet while conversion of the Latin Catholic Church was advantageous in terms of functional benefits, both social and educational, as well as aesthetic, to what ex extent could it be claimed that it represented a loss for the Latin Catholic community? The building was unused, and the adaptive reuse of the building in fact helped conserve a part of Latin cultural heritage. Thus, the Gerasen Church may have had the shortest functional lifespan, 1910 to 1967, of all of the Capuchin churches in the Ottoman Empire, but its transformation ensured the conversion of the building's fabric and the preservation of its heritage. So when we look uh, at the, um, in terms of validity or invalidity of um, the recognition of uh, the Catholic Church as a place of worship, um, could it be said that the conversion of the church into a, sec uh, into a secular space in a Muslim majority state 
reflects an implicit denial about its validity as a place of worship. If this can be said to be an accurate assumption, then the Goodison case study is a refutal. While the building underwent a functional transformation, there exists unquestionable continuity in terms of architecture and mission. In terms of architectural elements, the original building has essentially remained unaltered. With the exception of the shortening of the bell tower, no significant structural intervention has taken place. From the shape of the edifice alone, it can, be, it can still be identified as a church, both externally and internally. Externally, its religious identity is manifest through the retention of Gothic style windows with pointed arches on all four facades and by the monumental porch with its cradle style roof, vault and columns. Most explicitly on the main facade, the windows are terminated by a cross and directly above them are a set of cross motives slanting upwards. On the east and west facades of the building, placed on either side of the Gothic windows, are two small round windows with the Star of David. Other more discreet Christian symbolisms, including a cross in the shape of a dove plunging downwards above the main entrance, as well as floral and vegetable motifs on the panels of the two winged wooden main doors, such um, as an ear of wheat. Internally, the stained glass windows and the tile mosaics on the floor are strong visual indicators of the building's original use complemented by less obvious elements, such as a wooden spiral staircase leading to the platform and circular rosettes on the platform sections of the east and west walls. In relation to religious mission, the essence of the mission of the founders of the church, the Capuchins, has been preserved to a certain extent. The two important roles played by the Capuchin mis mission throughout Ottoman territories were the edification of society and the provision of children's education. Therefore, soon after the construction of their church in Girasun, they established a parish school on the same grounds adjacent to the church. Sisters from the religious order of St. Joseph were brought to administer the school, which became known as the French School of, Saints, of the Sisters of St. Joseph. Albeit unintentionally, the Capuchin Church's transformation into a building serving children's education was a continuation of an essential element of the former Capuchin mission in Gudesson. Today, the library has over 17,000 books and over 28,000 members. There are many books, including reference and periodicals on topics such as children's literature, history, psychology, and social sciences. In addition to books, there are CDs and DVDs of educational uh, and documentary nature science and nature, plastic models and educational board games such as chess. So what was the uh, purpose of the retention of the former church's overtly Christian features after its conversion into a mosque? Especially in view of the Islamic injunction for the removal of non-Muslim features on converted buildings. The short answer, touristic objectives. The children's library is under the management of the Republic of Turkey's Ministry of Culture and Tourism, rather than the Garrison municipality. And this is clearly shown on a golden colored plaque suspended to the right of the main door behind a prospects panel headed by large capital letters, Republic of Turkey, Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Similarly, the library appears on the website of the Giddeson Provincial Culture and Tourism Directorate under the title of Places to Visit in Giddeson. The library is therefore considered among the city's touristic buildings. 
and it is even included in city tours. As regards political stances, governmental efforts have been made to highlight the building's original function with a sign resembling a street sign written in capital letters and placed directly outside the front iron fence to the left of the main gate that reads children's library for a Catholic church. Likewise, the golden colored plaque on the wall outside the library's main door provides a short but imprecise description of its history. Therefore, full recognition is given of the building's former and original function as a Latin Catholic church. At a social level, recognition of the validity of the religious space of the other can be discerned through the press. Newspaper reports have been overwhelmingly positive about the conversion and have even given due recognition to the building's religious history, with some even emphasize, emphasizing the continuation of its distinct religious character, such that, as the title of a report by a newspaper called Aksham, dated uh, 24th of February 2019, which says its exterior is a church, its interior is a library. In, addition, uh, in an undated and unauthored report by Haber Kaos, the building's architecture and features were praised before it concluded that it is one of the most beautiful examples of non-Muslim buildings in Giresun, with its facade arrangement, interior floor covering, window shapes and decorative ceiling." Unquote. Regardless of the overwhelmingly positive reporting, suspicions were inevitably voiced about the intention behind the preservation of explicit religious features, with a report in the newspaper with a, with a religious leaning called Yeni Atik, Akit, sorry, titled Christian Pop Propaganda in Library in which it asserts that young minds are being confused with Christian and Jewish figures. Yet, such can be described as mere marginal opinions. In conclusion, the Giresun case study represents a unique example in the long and varied history of the conversion of Latin Catholic places of worship under Ottoman and Turkish rule. The preservation of the building's original structure and religious symbolism, albeit for touristic objectives, provides recognition of the validity of a non-Muslim space of worship. Yet it reflects a memory of a once rich religious diversity in Anatolia, which is ever diminishing in contemporary Turkey. Thank you very much for your attention. Sayın Arberam, mikrofonunuz kapalı açabilir misiniz lütfen? Uh, can you please unmute your mic? Can you hear me? Şu anda duyabiliyorum. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa, for uh, your uh, wonderful presentation. And um, now uh, we shift to the second um, presentation made by uh, Aileen de Tapia. Um, so I'm very glad to introduce her as a free, friend, as a colleague. Uh, she's um, teaching now, she's a professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And um, she defended her PhD thesis on the relations between uh, Roms and uh, Muslims in uh, 19th century Cappadocia. And, and this was a work in the framework of a partnership between the Ecole des Hautes Etudes uh, en Sciences Sociales of, of Paris and the Boazici uh, University in Istanbul. Uh, she has been a lecturer at the Galatasaray University and also a postdoctoral fellow 
at the Ex Marseille University at my university. So I had the chance to uh, discuss many times uh, with, with her. Uh, her main uh, research focuses on uh, religious interactions between Roms and Muslims, uh, on shared worship uh, at the sacred places, and uh, religious heritage in Turkey. So uh, I think the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, dear uh, Dionigi Albera. And uh, I would like also warmly thank Adip for the invitation and all the organizers of this impressive and so amazing conference. Thank you uh, very much. So I will share my PowerPoint. Oops, it's just the end. Okay. Um, in 1923, the exchange of population between Greece and Turkey ended the Greek Orthodox or Rum presence in most parts of Anatolia. In the region of Cappadocia, the Rum communities, which were mostly uh, Turkish speaking, uh, had prospered economically from the mid 19th century, mostly thanks to migration movements towards big cities, Istanbul ahead, and philanthropic activities. They especially built new huge churches which remain without faithful after 1923. In the first Republican decades, some of, of, some of them were converted into mosques, other were destroyed or simply abandoned. Many were desecrated and turned it into stables, warehouses or factories. Among these churches, the Kimesis Teotoku Church of Nefshir, today known as Meriem Anakidisesi or Church of the Virgin, experienced a particular fate. Um, this presentation will follow the different lives of the Meriem Church of Nefshir from its construction in the late Ottoman period up to now, including its transformation into a prison but also more recent developments that have turned it into a new symbol of local heritage and have led to contestation against its degradation and calls for its preservation. The region of Cappadocia in central Anatolia was mostly inhabited by Muslim Orthodox Christians, the Rums, and Armenian communities who were all settled in towns, but also in villages. The Rum communities of Cappadocia had the specificity to be mainly Turkish speaking. They used Turkish as their primary language and wrote Turkish using the Greek alphabet. We generally call them the Karamans. In the 19th century, the rooms of the community of Nefshir were part of these Karaman, so Turkish speaking uh, rooms. They were concentrate, concentrated in, in three adjacent districts of the town, the Rum Bash Malisi, Rum Orta Malisi, and Ashal Malisi. These three districts were known as a wall as the Rum Malisi. This area is today known as the Jumuriet Malisi. In the 19th century, Nefshir, as its name suggests, was still a quiet recently established town since the, since the village of Mushkara was turned into a, the town of Nefshir during the time of Nefshir Lidamat Ibrahim Pasha, who was the Sadrazam, one of the Sadrazam, the main one maybe, during the Tulip era in the beginning of the 18th century. Following uh, its, its founding, the town benefited from an important migration of uh, rooms coming from surrounding villages to the, near, the new town. Uh, throughout the 18th and the 19th century, the room population of Neapoli, as the rooms called it, became increasingly, increasingly uh, dense. In the 19th century, the room community of Nefshir, as many other communities of Cappadocia, became more prosperous uh, thanks to its migrants living and working in bigger cities of the empire as well as abroad. The migrants collected money thanks to associations of uh, compatriots or M Sheris, and uh, they paid for the construction of buildings, of public buildings, mostly hammams, 
schools, libraries, and churches in their community of origin. Uh, this is in this context that two big churches were built in the Rum Malesi. The first was actually already existing. It was the Agios Georgios Church built in, uh, in 1797 and enlarged in the uh, 1860s and again in the uh, 1880s. Today, this church is known as the Chan Le Kilise, but only the bell, uh, the bell tower remains. The second one is the Kimesis Teotoku Church built in 1848-49. Uh, it is a quite large church and is today known by inhabitants of Nefshir as the Meriamana Kilisesi, but also as the Jezaivi Kilise or Eski Jezaivi, namely the former prison. As all the churches of the Rum communities of Cappadocia, it was abandoned in 1923, since the Rum community of Nefshir, as all the rooms of Anatolia, were forced to leave their homeland because of the exchange of population in 1923. Between 1923 and the late 1940s, the church experienced a fate similar to many other churches of the 19th century of Cappadocia, in Cappadocia, since it was abandoned without faithful. But, its life radically changed a few de decades later when it was transferred, transformed into a prison in the late 1940s. From these days, the church began to be named by locals the Jezaevi uh, Kilise. To become a real prison, everything inside the building was reorganized. Numerous walls and a second floor were constructed to create dormitories, isolation cells, but also prayer rooms, lunch room, lunch room kitchen, bathroom, and toilets. Wall paintings were covered, and outside the walls of the courtyard were consolidated and elevated. As a prison, the building uh, hosted numerous political prisoners, some of them being very famous intellectuals, poets, and filmmakers. Oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one of the first prisoners uh, was the writer Kemal Tahir, who was sent there in 1948. In 1951, it is the poet uh, Aziz Nesin who was exiled to the prison of Nefshir because he was keeping writing political pamphlets in the prison of Istanbul, he was first incarcerated. Another poet, Hassan Hussein uh, Korkmazgil, also spent a few months in the prison of Nefshir. This is here that he met for the first time Aziz Nesin. As a last example, in 19. 61, uh, the filmmaker Yilmaz Güney was arrested and sent to the prison of Nefshir. He spent 20 months in this prison where he wrote uh, his first novel, Boynu Bukuk Öldüler. About uh, this month spent in the prison, uh, Yilmaz Güney told that it changed the course of his life and that the prison of Nefshir had been his uh, school. The novel, uh, Boynu Bukuk Öldüler, was published about 10 years later. In the preface, Gunei remembered how he wrote his novel on a small table he kept on his bed located in the corner of the dormitory of political prisoners. Finally, after the coup of 1980, new political prisoners were sent to Nefshir. According to one of them, Mukremin Tokmak, who is today at the head of an association for the protection of cultural heritage in Cappadocia, leftist prisoners asked for the uncovering of the wall paintings in their dormitory, but the latter did not stay uncovered for long. When dormitories of prisoners were changed and leftists replaced by um, right-wing nationalist prisoners, the paintings were recovered. In 1983, with the opening of a new modern prison in, Nef in Nefshir, the Jezaevi Kilise was closed and abandoned again. However, already before its closing, the building had already begun a secondary job as a film set. In 1973, 
uh, 10 years earlier. The Jezai Viki Lisset became the movie set for the movie Marpus, a Yeshil Cham uh, movie, narrating the story of an imprisoned uh, woman, a woman played by Turkan Shurai under the direction of uh, Nejat Saida. The movie won the Alton Portacal Award, so it was one of the famous Yeshil Cham movies. In the closer past, the ruins of the building were again used as a shooting place, not for a movie, but for a TV series uh, or a DZ called Emanet. The set was prepared inside the church without any authorization, and the staff of the series broadcasted on Fox Turkey decided to cut one of the metal girders which maintains the main columns under the dome of the church. The scandal was discovered by the local acti activist Nkremin Tokmak, the president of the Cappadocia Tari Kultur Araştırma ve Kuruma Derneği. Uh, Tokmak alerted the media and lodged a complaint against the DZ producers. The staff of the TV show claimed that the building was already in ruins before they entered it and that they decided to cut the girder to make the shooting easier and have a better image of the background. After this scandal, a prefabricated lodge has been settled in front of the church uh, with a guardian. Other examples of room or Armenian churches converted into prison uh, exist in Turkey, as in, for instance, in Gaziantep, in Sivas, Urfa, or Giresu. Some of them have uh, even also been using also as a shooting set, but most uh, today conver are converted into a mosque or a museum. As for the Nefshir Jezai uh, after 1983, uh, it remained abandoned again and was progressively damaged by numerous acts of vandalism by treasure hunters mostly, uh, since let me remind that um, as it was already mentioned yesterday, in Anatolia, former Christian buildings are often considered as potential places for uh, treasures. In the very last decade, several projects of uh, restoration were proposed and sometimes decided, but any of them were applied until now. In uh, 1996, um, the church was entrusted to the municipality of Nefjir and a restoration project was proposed in uh, 2003, but never submitted to the regional directorate uh, for heritage protection. The question of the er heritageization of the Meliamana church is therefore an old question, but it has uh, become more pressing in the 21st century with the, em the emergence of a new awareness of the public opinion for the minorities of Anatolia and their history, but also because of the beginning of the Cancel de Nushim or Urban Transformation Project. New changes have occurred in the very last years and the Miriamana church begins to become a symbol for local cultural and religious heritage. With the urban politics of Kensal de Nushum that began in Nefshir in 2009, the former Christian districts of the town became the place of new projects of construction under the hands of Toki. In June uh, 2013, the Murtaj and uh, the residents of these uh, districts once again uh, drew attention to the gradual degradation of the church and the need for its restoration to revitalize the district's economy. Several petitions were launched by local association for heritage protection, attracting the attention of, uh, on the bad condition of the church. The Chamber of Architects also lodged a complaint against uh, the Toki project, which was planned in the historical district of the town. However, nothing was done, and the church remained alone in the middle of nothing. You can see it in the uh, corner of the, of the photo. Um, so almost, of the all, almost all the old uh, houses of the districts have been demolished and only the church remain uh, now. First new constructions began in the low part of the district and in the area under the Calais of Nefshe. However, on the side of the, of the castle of the Calais, the discovery of a huge underground city in 2014 put an end to this cancel de Nushum in this area. 
the so-called discovery of this underground city that was immediately announced as being the biggest one in Cappadocia and even in the world opened the way to a new project with a touristic focus this time. This um, underground city has been named Kayashir. It is currently managed by the Kayseri Releve ve Anatlar Midurlu. And incidentally, uh, this area is not under the supervision of the Cappadocia Area Directorate, the Alan Bashkanle, which has recently been created to replace the National Park of Cappadocia, the Milli Park. Uh, the project around the Kayashir aims actually the creation of a museum in the underground city, as we already uh, know, uh, a museum in Kaimaklu or Derinkuyu. And uh, peripheral touristic activities are also planified. The uh, castle of Nefshir, for instance, has begun to be restored uh, recently. And a reconstruction of formerly destroyed historical building is also forecasted. The restoration of the church is, is also including in this uh, broader project. In that context, the, the restoration of the church, which was in the end of the mun municipality of Nefshir, has been recently transferred to the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. The whole budget for the restoration comes consequently, consequently from the ministry. The wish to connect Kayashir and the Meriamana Church through a common project of cultural heritage and tourism is obvious, even though, uh, for now, there is not yet a clear and definitive uh, master plan. According to information I get from staff of the municipality of Nefshir, the definitive project should be published in the course of this year. However, for now, the general idea is to connect the Meriamana Church to Kayashir through a road that would make a curve around the church. If this plan is confirmed, it would mean that most visitors coming to Kayashir will see the Merimana church from outside, probably from their car, and uh, will not be incited to visit the church. On the building itself, uh, the project aims the restoration of the outside facades. Inside, the curtains uh, are to destroy the walls and other remains of the prison to come back to the original building. The restoration has officially begun a few months ago and a billboard at the entrance of the site mentions a building company based in Karaman Marash. Wishes of locals and cultural heritage association were to see the of a museum on the history of the town of Nefshir, of, Nef of Nefshir inside the church, the idea being to include all the different lives of the building and the town, including the history of the Christian communities, but also the carceral past of the church. The ministry representatives claims that they have indeed a project of museum inside the church, but nothing is sure for now. Moreover, we do not know what will be the focus of the museum if it is really created someday. We thus, we thus uh, need to see if the building will not experience the same fate as most of the 19th century churches of Cappadocia, which have been restored uh, in the last decades. Their walls are restored, the inside cleaned up, and the building is generally then locked down to prevent visitors from entering in. If a museum is created inside, it would imply that the church will remain open. Indeed, um, numerous example of, uh, examples of recently restore, the restored churches are available in Cappadocia. They show that after the restoration, which is generally followed by an inauguration in the presence of the Patriarch of Constantinople and a small group of faithful, the building is locked down and no other religious or cultural activities are proposed inside, except sometimes yearly mass organized by the Patriarchate. The future of the Jezaev Ecclesia is consequ consequently still unknown. However, this church with a quite short life in comparison with many other sacred places in Anatolia, experienced already different lives, being successively and sometimes at the same time, a sacred place, a prison, a ruin, and a shooting fet, uh, and it will, it may probably su succeed in surviving to this new trial. We will probably see in the next years what, we, what will be uh, its next life. Thank you.
Sayın Arbera, buyurun lütfen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor de, de Tapia. Um, and uh, for, for this uh, presentation, also for the, these images, uh, which were very, very uh, appealing uh, and uh, that uh, show very well uh, what uh, is happening in this, uh, in this region. Um, now uh, we can shift to uh, Professor Beatrice uh, St. Laurent. Um, she received her PhD in uh, Islamic art uh, at uh, Harvard University. And uh, her doctoral thesis focuses on the late Ottoman period of Bursa, uh, the first uh, Ottoman capital. She is now professor of art history uh, in the Department of Art and Art History uh, at uh, Bridgewater State University in uh, Bridgewater, Massachusetts, the United States. And uh, she has been involved in research on the restorations of the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, for 30 years. And she has published many book chapters, many articles on, on this subject. And uh, she's uh, currently completing a book on uh, seventh century Jerusalem as well as another book on the uh, recent uh, um, restoration of the Dome of the Rock and al Mosque. Uh, she will speak uh, now uh, in this conference on religious monuments of Bursa and their abandonment or transformation in the late uh, 19th century. So the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good. Can you hear me? Good yes. afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for including me in this. As you've heard, I haven't been working in Bursa for a long time, but it was the subject of my thesis. So, um, Bursa is the first capital of the Ottoman Empire with a legacy in the Greco-Roman world. Bythenia, uh, Byzantium, is an interesting stage to examine the reuse of religious spaces, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. And for this paper, limited to monuments surviving from the Tanzimat and Abdul Hamid periods. This paper examines the status of some religious monuments, um, uh, their transformation to other purposes, or abandonment in the face of political change and population movement. Bursa, previously called Prusa, was always a city that thrived on its commercial activity of both trade from the south and for its local silk industry, which was heavily developed during the empire and exploited by Europe, notably France, in the late Ottoman period. This paper, examines religious structures in the city, Christian, Jewish, and Muslim, surviving, transformed, and or destroyed. The city setting at the base of Uluda, or the second Mount Olympus, overlooking the Yeshilova, or the Green Plain in this period, is divided south by north by two rivers, the Gökdere in the east and the Chilimbos in the west, which power the factories of the prolific silk industry of the city. Historically, the arrival of the Ottomans in Bursa in 1326 heralded great modifications to the city. The Hisar or citadel, along the residence of Christians under Byzantine sovereignty, including seven neighborhoods and seven churches, became the center of Ottoman Muslim authority, and the Christians were moved to areas outside of the Hisar, if not outside of Bursa. With the shift in political authority, formerly Christian monuments were dedicated to new purposes, new Muslim functions or destroyed, such as the monastery of St. Elias that was replaced by the tomb of Osman. There was already a well-established Greek neighborhood of Surdibi, Chakud Hamam, Mahalasi, just below Taphane in the northeastern corner of the Hisar. That neighborhood included a large church which does not survive. 
The other early Greek neighborhood was that of Balut Pazara, located between Kapalachosha and just north of Surdibi, and also had a church, the Church of St. John the Baptist, the ruins of which are incorporated in a park, and, the, and there also was a silk factory in that neighborhood in the 15th century. We will examine the survival of Christian churches in the two major Christian neighborhoods of the area, well known as Muradie, Demir Kapa Mahalasi, and Kayabasha Mahalasi in the west, and in the other Christian district of the city, that of Setbasha Mahalasi in the eastern part of the city. Muradi Kurie created a Muslim center in the largely Greek Christian neighborhood and was the neighborhood of hotels for visiting foreign tourists. Setbasha was the more upscale neighborhood of the Armenians, factory owners, both Christian, Muslim, and European foreigners who lived in Bursa at the time. Muradie, or the Greek neighborhood, experienced two major periods of religious architectural development. Early on in the 14th century with the movement of Greeks from what is today modern Greece in Thrace, and later in the 19th century with the development of silk and tourism industries. Much of what was built early on was supported in the 19th century by an increasingly strong European influence and control over the economy of the silk industry. There were two churches in Muradie district, Demir Kapı, was the first located on the hill overlooking the plain at the time. That neighborhood was created and populated by Christian Greeks who I propose moved during the time of Murat I in the 14th century to Bursa from the Greek Thracian village of Demir Kapaja on the Vardar River. It formed the core of the Mahale or neighborhood. In the 19th century up through the 1920s, it was also near the major area of hotels for foreign tourists and those involved in the silk industry. The new Greek Orthodox Church was the Church of the Archangels built in the 14th century, dated by inscription above the entrance. It formed the core of the new Christian neighborhood on the southern slope, west of the Hisar. It was built with the traditional Byzantine and Muslim architectural, as, as the Muslim and architectural monuments in the region of stone and brick and had a tiled, it was a tiled roofed basilica with a round apse. It's hard to know if what survived is from the 14th original or the 19th century restoration or rebuilding in 1835 under Mahmoud II. The church lost its entire congregation in the 1923 exchange of populations and in 1926 it became the property of the Yilmaz family functioning as a silk spinning factory until 1985 when it was abandoned. This building still stands and is still visible on Google Earth. The second church is in Kaya Basha Mahalasi, which is also known as Simavian Mahalasi, settled by Greek Christians, quote from Semavian or Semavian Dan, quote unquote. Semavian was not the correct uh, term, but the Greeks who were moved here during a period of resettlement during a challenging political period. They no doubt came from Simavna, today Kiprinos in Thrace, which was conquered by the Ottomans by the mid 14th century and located west of Dim Dimitoka, not far from Edirne on the border with Turkey today. The Church of the Holy Apostles dates from 1437 during the period of Murad II in the 15th century, whose royal coulier is just west of the church. The church was of alternating layers of brick and stone, that traditional, same traditional building material of both Byzantines and the Ottomans. It is reported that the current structure was one rebuilt in the 18th century after a fire in 1787, again during the reign of Mahmoud II. The church went out of use in the 1923 transfer and has served as a silk factory and, and to tune a tobacco uh, depot since that time. At the end of the 19th century, the church with its bell tower was intact uh, in an Abdullah Freya photo. Wrong clicker. Oop. Sorry.
think I'm missing a slide. <laughs> the, um, it was reported in the 1980s, the building was intact when I was visiting Bursa and doing my documentation. And, and in 2015, it was reported that the roof had collapsed, that the walls were still standing and remains in the gardens of the military headquarters. That still seems to be the case today as seen in Google Earth. The Armenian neighborhood of Setbashva, east of the Gökdere River was heavily rebuilt after a major fire in 1863. There were once two Armenian churches identified as the Armenian Protestant and Armenian Catholic churches dating from the 18th and 19th centuries. Protestant church was located on Ipekcelik Jadesi, south of and near the Setbashva Kapusu, a bridge. It was on the right side of the street of the multi-ethnic Muslim and Armenian neighborhood of silk factory owners. Please note on the slide the uh, French church, which I'll be speaking about later for its location. Protestant church was actually the church of the American Board of Foreign Missions and part of a larger complex, including a school. There was a chapel and school and a house that burned down on July 2nd, 1854. It was rebuilt to fire code in brick, was partially destroyed in the February 1855 earthquake and completely destroyed in the April aftershock. It was not rebuilt and was replaced later with a secular school. A Catholic church was located just north of the main east, -west, east to west street, not far from Yeshil Jomi. Bursa was said to be the location of the Armenian Patriarchate before it moved to Istanbul in the 15th century. So there was an important and long-standing Armenian community in the city. The building was an 18th century house transferred to the Armenian Catholics in 1831. Since 1923, it's been used as a tobacco warehouse and is presently abandoned. In 2016, it was up for sale for $1.5 million from a private owner and more recently in January 2021 was offered $800,000. Since it was registered as an historic monument in 1986 and may or may not be protected by UNESCO since 2014 as a heritage site, which is a project that I advised on with Giora Solar who led the UNESCO team. The current owners are descendants of uh, tobacconist Sali. Hirajibusha, president of Buraspor Football Club. Another church remains in Bursa to be discussed. The French church on the Rakum Jadesi, located on the hill on the west side of the Gurkdere River, in the then still quite underdeveloped part of the city. It was built by the Fille de la Charité of the Order of the Lazaristes, who had been in Bursa since 1857 or 1858. Church was completed on August 11th in 1880, funded by Monsieur de Vaux of the Banque Batuman in Istanbul. It served the Levantine community resident in the city. The church was a stucco fired brick with a wood roof covered by Marseille terracotta tiles rather than the locally produced ones. The style is decidedly European neo-Gothic with pointed arched windows. The church has a large apse with a small bell tower dominating the entrance. On the interior, a large oval dome covers the nave and the dome pendentives contain paintings of the evangelists. While the church remained minimally active until 1948, it closed and was briefly used as a warehouse. In the early 1980s, while I was in Bursa, the church was closed, abandoned and in poor condition. The church has since reopened between 2002 and 2004 and been restored and the interior dome repainted. It is now the French Church Cultural Center of Bursa, serving four different congregations, Latin Catholic, German Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Protestant. There was an order in 2016 to close the church, but that order has been rescinded. The church is the only church that survives in the city maintaining a religious function. Jewish community and neighborhood of Yehudilik was based on Arab Shukru Jadesi, 
was well, and it was well established in the 14th century and remains located at the southern base of the Hisar, just off of Altaplanmark Jadisi. There were originally three synagogues in the neighborhood, the original 14th century co community of Armaniat Jews, as local Jews were known in the Byzantine period, and Spanish Ladino speaking exiles expanded the size of the community in the 16th century. In 1886, the population numbered 2,800. Before World War I, 3,500. Dropped to uh, 1,865 in 1927 due to migration to South America. In 1939, rose to 2,400. By 1969, 300 to 450 remained. By 77 to 90, dwindled to 92, 97, about 100, and I don't have a current count. The oldest synagogue is the Eschayim, um, dates, dates from the 14th century and was used for 600 years but burned down in 1940. The other two, Mayor and Gerush, were established by Spanish exiles in the 16th century and survived to today. Mayor, founded by exiles from Mallorca, was in regular usage until 1975 when it closed for services due to financial difficulties. The building interior is centrally planned and has columns surrounding the core of the structure, holding the Torahs. According to one report, it is still used for special events and washing of the dead, but since 2003 remains in danger of destruction. The Gerush, or cast out or exiled, is the largest seating 500 men and 200 women and was built under Sultan Bayazid II and restored by Leon Parville after the 1855 earthquake, along with Yeshil Jami and Yeshil Turbe. The interior of Gerush has a circle of columns surrounding a centrally placed main bima of the synagogue. The Torahs placed in the center in the Ehal of the Ark came from Spain with the Sephardic, Sephardic expulsion and migration. Spanish-inspired Moorish decor adorns the interior dome. There are two tevas or pulpits, one in the lower area for men and another in the women's gallery. I visited this synagogue in 1982, having to fetch the key from a resident who lived up the street. For this time period, it's significant methodologically for this study to examine um, all aspects of changing use of religious Efkaf endowment property during the Tanzimat. The Ministry of Efkaf the Efkafi Humayun Nezerati, that managed the Wakf or Vakf endowment, financed and owned properties established, was established by the mid 19th century. These also affected Muslim religious property that was made available for sale during the Tanzimat. A good example to begin with this discussion is the Hukumet Konada or administrative center planned and built by the governor of the province, Ahmed Tafik Pasha, and that is this structure over here that survives only in an image. The land was bought in 1860 and the Konak was built in 1863 on a Vakf property in the eastern central part of the city where the brand new wide road designated as Yeni Yolu on one plan and later Gemlik Jadisi which ended in the center of the city, right in front of the building. The building was destroyed and replaced by a new Republican government center, I believe in 1925. A second example is the Belédie, or City Hall, which was built on Vakf property of a ruined structure tied to the 14th century Orhan Jami next door. Belédie is on the right, Orhan Jami on the left. So thus began a period in, uh, of the sale and conversion of mus religious Muslim property given over to secular monuments. I'd like to end on a lighter note. There is an anecdotal story of the governor of Bursa, Ahmed Tafik Pasha's enlargement of the road to Chekirge to the west of Bursa, providing easier access to it, to the, 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 the baths. In the path of straightening the road, there was an impediment of a Sufi sheikh's tomb. tomb. <clears throat> Supposedly, the Thik Pasha brought notables with him to the tomb and told Yurian Dede, the sheikh who walked, 
to walk. He put his ear to the tomb and said that the sheikh had no desire to remain buried and walked away. He, the tomb was soon after demolished. So it was not just Christian and Jewish monuments that were altered and destroyed, but Muslim ones that gave way to the path of change in Bursa. My position, I'm putting this on the screen because I wasn't sure if I was going to have time. I added it after Jamal's talk yesterday. Uh, my position on the origins of the Greek population in the Western neighborhoods is that they were moved from recently conquered regions uh, with the policy of population resettlement um, and in the early empire in a period of tribal dominance. The goal was effectively uh, to balance pol pol political reactions to conquest. An already blended society, both multi-ethnic and multi-religious, became even more so in the early empire. In the time periods involved for this paper, I propose that most of the uh, population came from northeastern Greece with the goal of creating a more settled society. For more on this topic, see Kafadar 1995. <laughs> also supporting this is the construction of the Mosque of Murat I, Tudavendigyad Jami, in Chekirge, in the path of creating new Ottoman neighborhoods. And the Greeks left for Greece in the exchange of populations, all in the path of nationalism. Oop. I've been away from Bursa for quite some time and working on the Ottoman transformation of the Dome of the Rock um, between the um, 16th and 20th centuries now, 30 years. I'm currently writing that book, as was said in the introduction, on the seventh century Arab settlement of Greater Baladisham which governed from the beginnings of Islam according to tribal identity and principles with egalitarian relationships with the non-Muslim communities under their control. There was an early on movement of the Byzantine, Christian, Jewish, and Samaritan, Samaritan and Persian Zoroastrian populations. So the early Ottomans only continued a practice that was, no, that was rooted in tribal culture and tribal identity from the beginnings of Islam. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Saint Laurent, for, um, for your presentation and for sharing with us your, uh, your very rich, tremendous uh, knowledge about uh, religious history of Bursa. Um, so uh, I think that now we have more or less 20 minutes, minutes left for for the discussion and uh, so i would like to start with some uh, some remarks um, it seems to me that the these interventions uh, contribute in a very interesting way to the general topic of this conference uh, by concentrating on modern and uh, contemporary period um, we have seen again the complexity of the dynamics of uh, conversions. Uh, as uh, Professor uh, Kafadar suggested, suggested uh, yesterday in his uh, keynote, uh, we should make a distinction between hard conversions and soft conversions, uh, which are gra gradual in time without a sudden decision. And uh, sometimes also hard conversions are less sudden than it may appear. Uh, and the example of Hagia Sophia is very telling about it. But also the uh, case studies that we have uh, seen uh, in this panel uh, go a bit in this, uh, in this direction. It seems to me that uh, uh, we, we can perhaps say that uh, in some respects, uh, the, sacred, the sacred places are uh, who which change their affiliation, um, which are converted, are like a palimpsest uh, that keeps something of their former, the former writing, which was inscribed 
on, on them, and this in spite of the transformations. So we, we are confronted with, the, with several paradoxes. Uh, we, we have seen as the secular transformation uh, of a church into a museum or a library may displace some elements of a continuity in the practices and in the architecture or the former use of the building. And Vanessa um, has shown this very well uh, in, for the shift from a church in, into a library. And <clears throat> also, um, sometimes the restoration, um, the coming back to the former religious status may in fact interrupt any kind of frequentation, transforming the building in an empty place, uh, in a place without people, without faithful, as uh, Eileen has, su has suggested with regard to uh, some examples in, in Cappadocia. So um, I, I will uh, start with some uh, remarks on, uh, um, on the, uh, and some questions on the presentations. Um, I will start with, uh, with Vanessa. Uh, I really enjoyed your, uh, your paper uh, because you show very well the complexity of the conversion of the building, um, in which, uh, uh, in, spite of, in spite of the, trans of the religious transformation, uh, there exists continuity in terms of architecture and also of a, a mission. So you also your your images show this very well how this the cross motifs remained, and also the mission of the founder founders of the church the capuchin capuchin um, remains as a palimpsest a bit. So they uh, this uh, building. Uh, continue to, to be devoted to children's education, for instance, or the edification of a society. And um, perhaps uh, um, you perhaps may add something about also the, uh, some tourist uh, um, aspect. Is, is this a, a new uh, habit of the, of the church as a, as a library? also uh, use in order to advertise the, the, the city for, for visitors. So this is a, a question. And um, also another question, you mentioned the, the absence of Latin Catholic Ottoman subjects in the city at the moment of the edification of the church. So do, do you have uh, information about the, the clientele uh, that was attending this church at the beginning? Of the century that was attending the church, uh, the, the school too, uh, in the, before the, uh, the, the, the transformation into a library. And uh, um, a third uh, question concerned the uh, Giresun Basilica of Gogora that you mentioned that was transformed uh, before into a prison and then uh, into a museum. Um, so I, I see some parallels with the, with the case studied by Eileen. So perhaps you can tell more uh, about this in, uh, in this perspective. So these, these are my questions. If you can. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your um, comments and your questions. Um, absolutely, in relation to your first question uh, about the um, touristic aspects um, of the uh, former Catholic Church current children's library, uh, tourism plays a very um, fundamental role in the decision to preserve um, the religious features within the Catholic Church. Um, and I think um, absolutely it's, it's become uh, um, an edifice of, of novelty within the city that um, is, is present on the um, touristic websites and is also part of a 
tour guides it's been incorporated into these uh, these gui uh, guides um, for tourists so um, it, I think a uh, like many of the edifices that have been converted into um, secular spaces more than mosques, uh, uh, there is an emphasis on um, trying to promote them in terms of tourism um, in, in order to um, attract uh, people's attention to uh the continuation as it were of the preservation of an uh, of an edifice of a historical significance albeit for uh, an alternate purpose um with regards to your second question about the absence of latin catholic ottoman subjects what, what was usual um in the founding of missions uh in in not necessarily large cities at the time garrison was a relatively small city uh, in different parts of the empire the main purpose was uh, to focus on uh, missionary activities and apostolic mission focusing on non-latin catholics so it was usually the orthodox and armenian communities which uh they would um whose con con conversion they would encourage and this was often um, catered to through uh, educational institutions which would serve uh, not only uh, local Latin Catholics because we need to remember in Gerson we had um, foreign merchants who were Latin Catholics and uh, they, they would um, most probably have had uh, children families with them uh, so these uh, these uh, educational institutes would uh, cater to um, Latin Catholic children, obviously, but also to um, the local Armenian, a Jewish and uh, Orthodox uh, communities, especially because they would teach uh, languages and, and it was encouraged for these children to, to learn foreign languages. Um, but I don't have exact details as to um, the number of, of children from the different denominations who attended the school or, or who, who in fact attended the churches. We know that there uh, in Garrison there was a presence of um, Armenian Catholics um, who, who would, uh, would have most probably attended the church. But um, obviously due to the uh, current uh, restrictions from the pandemic, I have not been able to access all of the archival sources which would be necessary for this study. Um, uh, in relation to your third question, I, I do not have a lot of information about the Gogora church, but definitely um, in relation to uh, Eileen's um, very <laughs> interesting presentation, uh, there, there is undoubtedly a link we see um, that edifices in certain periods were, also, were often converted to be used for specific purposes. Um, whether demographic or in, in order to fill a, a, a need within a particular period. And we often saw that during uh, the transition from the Ottoman period to the early, uh, early uh, Turkish Republic, where you'd have um, buildings converted into uh, storage houses churches i mean storage uh, storage houses or into even turkish baths and in order to serve an immediate need so in terms of its conversion into a jail well this was um a building considered suitable to to uh serve a specific social need at that period in time and we can see that it lasted uh you know a couple of decades so um yes this this was uh, a feature that was repeated uh, throughout the the um, turkish uh, republic i hope i have answered your questions adequately thank you very much uh, i think that it would be worthwhile to to have some uh, comparative work about this uh, Transformation in prison and in museum at different periods could, could be interesting, I think. Uh, uh, I guess, but perhaps Eileen uh, could uh, could say something about it. Uh, uh, so, uh, thank you again for your presentation, uh, Eileen, uh, about the, these uh, different lives uh, of these sacred 
of this place, which was a, a church, a prison, a ruin, a movie set, and also for um, for permitting us to 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 go inside your your laboratory, your because it is a, a work in progress, and you are looking at what uh, what is going to happen. Uh, so the you are looking also to the to the near near future with the with the issue of the the digitization uh, the the tourist touristic projects uh, uh, which are very crucial so can, can you perhaps uh, um, add something about the 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 actors the social actors which are involved in these in these projects you you also uh, so the, there's the, the state, the, the, the city, but also this um, um, cultural heritage association. Um, did, did you, uh, uh, have you been able to, to work uh, already on, on this, uh, this association, uh, about on their uh, sociological profile and, and so on? So um, this was, uh, you are also mentioned that a former prisoner or this uh, um, is now the head of uh, an association, um, and um, also, and I have also another uh, question about uh, the life uh, of uh, this place as a ruin, and all, more speci specifically about these uh, treasure hunters, um, um, and um, uh, which, who consider that the former Christian buildings are potential places of, uh, where it's possible to, to, to find uh, uh, treasure, treasures. And um, I was wondering if you have been, work, uh, have been working on this. So it reminds me a very huge tradition of uh, uh, tre treasure hunters in, in the history, both in European or Middle Eastern, Ottoman, Byzantine, with, with a lot of uh, um, intermingling uh, of uh, also involving uh, magic. Uh, so um, uh, I, I was wondering if there is something of this uh, about in, in these treasure, treasure hunters, or it is simply a matter of uh, uh, excavating in order to um, to to have a, a profit again. So, if there are also some, if there is a lore, some uh, some secret knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks and and questions. Um, Concerning the actors, uh, it's a bit difficult because you have uh, many actors and everything is currently um, changing again and again because of this uh, Kaya Share project, which has been uh, discovered in a very few years. So uh, until the few years ago, uh, it was the municipality of Nefshir which uh, had the, the ownership in a way of, of, uh, of, of the church. Uh, but with the change, uh, um, with the discovery of the Kayashir um, underground city, also with the change with the, the cancellation of the National Park of Cappadocia, which has been transformed into an, an, another uh, way of, uh, of uh, another, uh, how to say, um, institution, let's say, uh, everything is, 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 is changing in a, in a very short time. So it's difficult to have a, a clear vision of who is or which uh, institution is looking at which parts of, of this project. Uh, but we have, of course, uh, also the associations, the civil society, uh, which is um, uh, which pay very careful attention to the to, to this particular site, but not only, of course, for Cappadocia. The difficulty of this specific region is that you have so many churches, so many uh, cultural heritage that they have no enough time to protect and to, to attract the attention on, on, on every uh, 
sites which would need some restoration or, or, or protection. But um, yes, one of the actor of the maybe more um, active uh, actors uh, in, in the civil society is the one I, I mentioned, Mukremin Tokmak, who is one of my main um, uh, contacts in, 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 in the area. Um, he is also also a political activist, he, and but he is mostly very very um, uh, active in the in the um, in the preservation, but with not so much money and so much um, yeah financial support. So it's more in a way. Um, he, he, he tries to attract the attention of the media, of the local medias, of the national medias, uh, media for when there is a scandal like the the, the, the TV uh, series uh, which entered in the in the church without authorization. So it's more in a way um, a, a group of actors who try to attract the attention of the media and of the institutions, the political institutions on. The difficulties they can find in, in, in different sites, such as the, the Church of uh, Mariana Anna in, in that uh, specific place. But it's all often very difficult for them to be uh, to be heard by the municipality or by the Ministry of Tourism and, and, and Culture. So uh, the, 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 the compromise between all these different actors is uh, generally very, very difficult to find. Um, and um, for the, the, the treasure enters, it's, it's a very huge tradition, as you said, yes, uh, in Anatolia especially. And I know that in most of, in all the provinces of, of Turkey today, uh, still today, uh, you have people who think that, uh, especially uh, in the Christian former districts and especially in the religious, religious buildings, uh, you could be able to find any uh, yeah, treasures or, or um, gold or, or money or things like that. Um, I don't think it's connected to any magic um, tradition thing or, or, or belief. Um, it's, it's probably mostly linked to the fact that first, uh, there is this uh, legend uh, about the Christian communities, which were, according to the local people, um, very uh, rich and had m many uh, gold and, and so uh, uh, have potentially left uh, these uh, treasures uh, on, on, on the site. And it's also, co also connected by, to the, the, the fact, the idea that for the room, for instance, uh, at the moment of the exchange of population, the room communities or the room families uh, maybe thought that they would be able to come back and left uh, their money or their gold uh, inside some kind of, of, of uh, secret places. So there is this, um, this belief that uh, maybe we are able to, we could be able to find something, uh, especially in, in buildings like, uh, like the, the church is so uh, it's clearly a tradition, uh, a pitiful <laughs> tradition, let's say, because it's yeah. it caused very big damages uh, to the to the to these kind of buildings, of course. Okay, um, I don't. Thank you. Um, can you you have uh, still uh, uh, the time for a small question for Professor Saint Laurent? Uh, Yes, uh, so uh, thank you very yeah, much. Trump, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for your very precise radiography of the religious monuments of uh, Bursa. I had several uh, remarks and questions, but I, I would only like to, um, to ask uh, uh, something about this uh, uh, new French church cultural center. Um, if I, um, if you also mentioned this as a Protestant church, and then there are uh, different congregations uh, that are using it, uh, Latin, Catholic, Latin Catholic, German Catholic, exactly. Eastern Orthodox too. So can, can you say something very rapidly about uh, this kind of religious function, if there is a sharing 
of the of this place uh, or not um what i know is that it is being used by these various religious groups and is much more of a religious center for um the foreign population that still resides in bursa mm. the levantine population as well that's that's all i know about it i have not been in bursa for a very long time <laughs> since 2009 actually i haven't been in bursa but um I keep getting called back to Turkey uh, to either yes, publish yes. or speak because yes, yes. I yes, can't yes. avoid my I can't avoid my thesis and my uh, my involvement with Turkey. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that you will be able to uh, to come back to Bursa and to study this. Uh, uh, this I new hope so. I kind hope so of, well. of sharing of a second uh, place. Yes, uh, I, also have a, I have a Turkish sister who lives in Istanbul and still yeah. teaches at Editu. Yeah. So I'm very much in touch with my colleagues and friends in Turkey. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much to all the presenters. And, and so uh, we are at the end of this session. And please remind that you may register in the ADIP forum for your discussions and for the contribution on the uh, address that you that you know. Uh, thank you. Uh, now we uh, leave the floor to our presenter. Thank you very much, Professor Albera. I guess there are three more questions in the questions part before we finish. With your permission, I would like to read the question by Mine Yıldırım, myself. Thank you. For Dr. Obaldia, for successful pre preservation of a cultural religious heritage site, to what extent would you consider it necessary that the original community or communities connected to them are part of decisions made about the building. Thank you very much for your question, uh, Dr. Yildirim. Yes, um, I think it's very important. I saw the first part of your question and the subsequent too. Um, uh, it, it's a very important question. Um, I will give a short answer, however, um, and that is no, uh, consultation did not take place. And I think it's important when we are speaking about the Latin Catholic Church that we remember that the Catholic Church was not a local church, rather it, uh, it was a foreign church. Uh, the missionaries were foreign and they were affiliated to foreign provinces. Now, the majority of churches uh, were founded and run by religious orders as opposed to secular or diocesan priests. So the religious orders were affiliated to provinces abroad and decisions, fundamental decisions such as foundation of churches, the um, removal of communities back to their provinces of origin or the selling of churches uh, were taken at uh, the level of the province as opposed to um, of obviously in consultation with the religious orders, but uh, the, the main decision remained with the province. So it was a top down decision and um, any any um, decisions to sell a church or, or um, use it for an alternate space. Uh, would not have been uh, taken in consultation with the uh, Latin Catholic or other Catholics who were attending the church. In the case of the, the Gerasen uh, church, uh, there at the, the loss of the church was more a result of um, the lack of registration of the church following the form, uh, foundation of the uh, Turkish Republic. Uh, and this resulted in the loss of a lot of Catholic properties, not just churches, cemeteries, and other types of properties um, uh, to the either the Directorate of, of Religious Affairs um, or the Treasury or, or the municipalities because there was a lack of registration. So um, the decision was actually taken out of the hands of the religious order uh, as opposed to being an active decision on their part. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your question. <laughs>